Designing for Liberation, Experimental Research Program. This is a dis historical description of uh, design research program I was part of uh, throughout um, almost 15 years. It changed its name. It is overall framework, but it basically focused on the liberation of oppressed people. We didn't have that idea or the conception at the beginning of it, and I will describe how we get to that point. First of all, what is a design research program? I got this definition from this marvelous book written by John Redstrom, Making Design Theory. This book describes several layers or levels of design research organization mechanisms or ways of framing what you're doing with design research from the micro level of an experiment towards this macro level of building a design research science. I describe myself this multiplicity of framing opportunities as degrees of self-consciousness. How consciousness are researchers about what they are doing in terms of the collective accumulative knowledge they are building. So if you are just conscious of running an experiment and you do experiment after experiment without ever generalizing a method, you have a lower level of self-consciousness. And when I say self, I mean the collective subject that uh, leads this whole um, collective experiential activity or knowledge producing activity that typically involves not just academia, but also practitioners in industry settings, as well as social movements. I'm interested on uh, expanding this level of consciousness, this part of my research overall. I have another research program called Expansive Design, which sometimes intertwines with designing for liberation. But in general, the program is the mid-level where you see some specific things that are um, found in each design situation. And you also see generalizing things that um, appearing or manifesting several design situations. So the program is um, a kind of uh, intermediate knowledge production site. The kind of knowledge you design or you produce in a design research program is neither something that just applies to specific projects or something as broad as a design school or a school of thought. Uh, rather, a design program is this specific investigation that requires several different projects by several different people. And it's typically a collective endeavor. And it, this book by Johann Redstrom describes how these uh, different levels can articulate and uh, provide challenging opportunities for new design foundations. That's the whole point of the book. And I really like this book and how it frames design research. Well, there are other books or other um, articles that describes in more details what a design research experiment is, what a design project is, what a design school of thought is. I like specifically this article by Bang and Erickson about uh, the relationship between design programs and the research questions, the theoretical perspectives, the related works, and the overall challenges and matters of concerns that society uh, present to design researchers. So a design research program articulates all of these different contextual things as part of uh, the um, experimental setting. So what you can see in this picture, which is very important, is that design research program, this little box in the middle, is full of different experiments. So an experiment is something very uh, specific that you try to intervene or change in the world and see what you get from it, whereas a program involves several different of these investigations, these interventions, these uh, experimentations in the world. And every time you experiment, you're supposed to change the frame of references or your design research program. So there's a kind of a dialectical interaction between these two different levels of knowledge production. That's why it's an intermediate level uh, what the design research program uh, develops, intermediate level knowledge. There are other um, interesting researchers on um, describing how researchers move from one experiment to another one. 
I am here highlighting the work by Krog and Koskinen. They have written about this movement and, uh, and describing it as a drifting uh, movement. So they rely on this metaphor of the, um, speed driving when drivers are uh, doing, um, they want to uh, perform a, a very a quick shift in direction of their vehicle, but they don't want to lose speed and, and hit the brakes. So what they do, uh, they turn the wheel to the opposite side and instead of uh, changing the vehicle on that side to that side, because the vehicle is already having so much inertia in you know, its uh, momentum, its movement towards the other side, that actually the movement is twisted up and the car drifts away from uh, the ground. Then there's a kind of a risky uh, maneuver that you can do to um, uh, complete a curve in the highest possible speed, sometimes performed in NASCAR racing, but several other automotive competitions. And this is an interesting metaphor to think about how design researchers move from one experience to the other without um, losing the steam and without changing so much or changing entirely their directions or goals of the overall design research program. It seems like they are doing something crazy <laughs> and they are losing grips and losing control of their design research process, but instead, they're really trying to accumulate knowledge in a different way. Of course, the accumulative way of building up research is one experiment is very specific, and then the second one is a little more generic, and the third one is even more generic. That's how typically design research, uh, that's how typically experiments uh, accumulate knowledge in other fields, science for social science. They typically do this kind of um, generalization strategies. However, in design research, well, rather have more expansive ways of adding new research that um, expands the boundary of what we believe to be possible, pretty much relying on drifting, but also serial design experiences are quite interesting. They don't share the same kind of principles or experimental settings, but you learn from each of these experiments. And the most fav the fav my favorite one is probing, when you actually experiment with something that you have so little knowledge that you cannot even tell why you actually uh, probing that thing and trying out that thing. The connection can only be uh, justified in hindsight after the experiment is done. Uh, just to wrap up this definition of what design exper research experiments are, they are pretty much uh, um, interdisciplinary uh, foundations based on the experimental traditions in science and experimental traditions in the arts. So when we say that we are doing experimental design research, we mean both of these meanings, that is indeed something based on rigorous experimental methodologies, where you try somehow um, to observe the conditions for experimenting, so you take notes of that, you don't control, you drift through these experiments, uh, but you also lose control and somehow leave the situation to uh, tell more things than the experimenter design or the experimental design. So instead of being so closed with defining uh, independent, independent variables and dependent variables, like in science, um, design researchers, they experiment with an open mind, pretty much like an uh, artist experiment. And the results, outcomes of those different experimental traditions are combined so if, if the methodology and approach is combined, so are the outcomes. And design research experiments, they generate as much as data hypothesis theory, as much as innovative artifacts, new processes, methods, new forms of addressing the audience. Yeah, that's definition is really interesting how uh, these uh, different traditions are mended. Stephen provides this great uh, article on, on experiments in uh, the arts and experiments in the science. But in my... Um, own understanding of what the design research program is that goes something which is higher level than design research experiment, of course. So what binds together these different uh, experiments? So uh, based on my readings of the previous mentioned literature, um, I list here five elements that are very important to define what a design research program is. And I'm not really talking about experiments again just to make sure you understand that I'm talking about something which is a 
at a higher level that involves several experiments. So what binds together those different experiments is a um, growing, sometimes tacit or unarticulated or even culturally bounded worldview. What is a worldview? For example, modern worldview, that the world is something that is being produced by humans and humans, um, they will produce the world for themselves. That's the modern worldview where the, the world is mostly a material, a medium to change and to produce outcomes. This is very foundational to any kind of design research. Either design researchers adopt that worldview, mostly unacknowledging it, but for example, the science of the artificial, written by Herbert Simon, a foundational text in design research, departs from that worldview. But you can also challenge that worldview and question it and go otherwise, like for example, uh, anti-colonial, decolonial scholarships that try not to be modern or they depart from the assumption that the world is active, the world is not an object to be transformed, not a material, but the world is perhaps a person. The world is actually we, we are worlds, so we cannot change ourselves in a detached way we, because we are part of the world. These are two different world fields and they clash often in design research. Uh, but beyond, beyond that, uh, which is more ideological or theoretical, there are definitely some concrete historical trajectories that also clash from these different worldviews. There are multiple ways of doing design research that has been going on for decades, sometimes centuries. These historical trajectories, they consolidate into some ethical stances. So how do you typically deal with dilemma like either to treat people as uh, material or to treat people as subject. People are object or people are subject of design uh, research. This is a basic ethical stance. And some design researchers follow the uh, Kant philosophy, um, but they don't necessarily translate into that the research questions. For example, they depart from the assumption that, well, human beings should never be reduced to objects but then in the research questions, they ask questions like, how can we uh, design a process that will include people as users in this particular setting? And that's already may, uh, reducing people to things because a user is never a full um, self-defining human. It's not a, a human defined from the outside, from the framing of designers. It's definitely a prejudice that I impose on other people. And here you can see some kind of a, controversies and contradictions that starts to become more clear once you start articulate these different levels of uh, design research program foundation. And finally, last but not least, aesthetic qualities, like for example, usability in a modernist design research program or relationality in the anti-modern research program. These aesthetic qualities are the kind of effect or the kind of um, self-indulging result of the design research which is sought, which is sometimes the way how the ethical stance is uh, embodied and lived throughout the experience of being in the world as a design researcher. That's why I believe there's a, a very important connection between ethics and aesthetics, but I don't want to go into the much details right now. I just want to point out these are five different elements that are articulated differently in each design research program, but by defining them, you can understand what is the level of um, uh, theoretical understanding I'm talking about here. Now, let's apply this provisional framework I just devised for analyzing designing for liberation and beginning with worldview. What is the worldview of designing for liberation, this research program that I'm busy with for almost 15 years? Well, I come from an anti-colonial scholarship foundation, uh, um, so I, I depart from the assumption that uh, Brazil and um, South America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and Americans in general, they, are, um, they, have, they share this um, past of being colonized by European nations, and that past created a um, geographical or even ontological division between a made world, which was Europe, and the world to be made, Americas, and later on Africa, Asia, Oceania, 
and other places in the world that Europeans thought that they could better make those places than indigenous people did or made. And this uh, um, divided, dichotomic worldview is also the origins of the modern worldview that is so foundational to design research. And Europe did not recognize these worlds made by indigenous people, as I mentioned, but actively they unmade those worlds. Every civilization that was already here installed in, Af in America has been destroyed by uh, European colonizers, sometimes through um, very um, shady political articulations, other times through direct confrontation and genocidal wars that are still going on as of today. In Brazil, for example, in Amazon forests, there are um, a couple of, or even I would say more than a couple, dozens of indigenous nations uh, threatened by mining activity and the people who, who are um, supporting those miners are typically uh, companies uh, from Europe and from other parts of the, uh, let's say, civilized or the so-called civilized world that needs all of this mining materials to produce their um, high technologies and things like that, that enables the modern way of living. That. So this connection between the unmaking of those um, past worlds, uh, what they called uh, before new worlds, but now I would say the world to be made, uh, it is pretty much connected to the making of the new, the old world, or what I prefer to call the made world, Europe, and other places that colonized uh, other civilizations and destroyed them, even denying the status of being a civilization. Here you can see, for example, this picture, the destruction, uh, the invasion of the, um, the Central America, um, well, the invasion of these nations that lived in what we now call Central America, but by that time, these people, they would call Abiyayala, Turtle Island, Pindurama, and many other names. And these indigenous people, the people who inherit those traditions, they still call those worlds under such names as a mode of resisting this imposition of the concepts of America, New World, uh, Civilization, Western Society, and so on. So this is the basic worldview that I work with, and that worldview is being attacked politically, and it's probably one of the uh, biggest uh, political debates nowadays in the United States, where I'm actually recording this uh, lecture by now. There is a political uh, candidate who is all the time saying that the biggest problem for the United States are the immigrants that comes from Central America, but also South America and the Caribbean area. This, this person uh, is um, promising that uh, by electing the candidate, well, we could make America great again. What is When it was great again, when this uh, modern uh, civilization installed by European colonizers weren't, weren't being challenged by these people. So as much as we have immigration into the United States, there's more challenging, there's more indigenous voices, or at least people who are willing and interested on uh, challenging and, and proposing new ways of um, coexisting together that are not in alignment with the European colonizing mindset. So what is basically behind MAGA is this understanding that there are some worlds that needs to be made, worlds that haven't been made yet. For example, conservation areas um, uh, or indigenous lands, or even some um, nations in America that needs to have some development assistance or um, I mean, trade a relationship with the United States in a leadership position. Of course, the United States is the leader and uh, we, uh, these other parts of America are being treated as uh, the backyard of the United States. This is what is behind Make America Great Again. Uh, it's an ontological relationship with the different worlds where uh, the United States wants to be the America. Because if you think about what is implicit in this uh, uh, motto is that the United States is the only America. But think about it. All, all of these areas in, uh, in the continent of America, they're also America. They are not feeling that by electing this candidate, 
America as a continent will be great again. In fact, it will be great for U.S. So the real um, motto should have been Musga, <laughs> make United States great again. But by saying it's America, what is implying is that the United States is the leader of this continent. And this, even this overall and broader, this concept of a new world. And the new world is the American world, which it should be ex exported and through imperialism imposed on other nations, not just in the American continent, but through all other continents in the world. What is now known as the American lifestyle and globalization, but through a different way, because now it's a globalizing the nation itself and not the, just the, the, the life. Anyway, I don't want to explore that much. I just want to say that from that worldview, which is anti-imperialistic, anti-colonial, we have developed several different ways of designing. And now let's look at this historic tra trajectory of this uh, design research program. Where does it, is, how is it situated in the history of uh, design research tradition? I'm going to go back to the um, independence of Brazil, or the, um, the times when the independence started off, and the, the, I, I'm bringing here an example of the first graphic design product that has been produced in Brazil by the um, printing press that the Portuguese king allowed the, um, the colony to build only after the Portuguese king had to run away from uh, Napoleon invasion of Portugal and had to install himself and his family in the Brazilian colony then the king noticed how underdeveloped that area was. There were no printing press. So he commissioned the building of the first printing press. But instead of producing something that would be useful for um, the nation, or for the inhabitants, his priority was to um, spread ideological values that will make people feel they are identifying with the, with the king, with the queen, and the, over a car, court. So first product was a uh, uh, car deck uh, with um, the, family, the royal family members printed on them. And that's already a very interesting example of a colonialist graphic design product that marks the, uh, the beginning of this uh, graphic design history in Brazil and printing press. Imagine that this invention that has been around in Europe for almost 300 years it wasn't allowed to be installed in Brazil because of the colonialist strict policies that prevented development in the region, precisely the opposite of what the theoretical or ideological and even political justification for colonization was. That's why we are basically against colonization, because the practice is often the opposite of what the theory or the discourse is about. And since uh, independence of Brazil, I mean, the, by, by that same uh, century, we haven't overcome, or we haven't overcome that condition of dependence from uh, European nations. Sometimes it changes from Portugal to other nations, like in the uh, installation of these industrial design uh, schools in Brazil, we relied on the Ulm School of Design model, which comes from Germany. It was a very influential school. Uh, it influenced not just uh, the foundation of SD in Rio de Janeiro, but also many schools around the world, especially on, in underdeveloped countries like India, like uh, other places. And uh, this uh, Republican, independent Brazilian government still kept them importing design from abroad, pretty much what uh, was done by uh, the colonial government of before. And companies, they just followed. And this is still going on today. That's why we keep talking about coloniality. Uh, because this European design made itself into the world to be made, I mean in the new worlds or the formula colonies, as the only good design. And the sayings of Dieter Rams and several other icons of modern design, that good design is as little design as possible, they are inherently colonialist. Think about it. Nobody shows the favelas as examples of great modern design, but they follow strictly this kind of principles. They are a li as little as design as possible. They just build this uh, inhabitant, this um, self-made um, habitations, this cons self-constructed uh, 
uh, uh, housing because there was a, a, a lack of housing opportunities in the city that was growing and becoming developing so fast as uh, many other Latin American uh, metropolises were. And they are not bad designs, but unfortunately they are contrasted with this clean uh, design that Dieterams is showing. And there's definitely a contradiction between the form of design and the function of design. If you think about how much time it takes to get a minimalistic design for certain functions and how much time it takes for you to get um, uh, a functionalist design out of uh, a simple form like the favelas do, well, they are definitely, favelas are quicker built, so they should even be considered more modern than uh, what Dieterams is showing. But anyway, what I, well, the point I want to make is that Dieterams and other modern designers, they are designing for privilege. And the underside of it, this part that they conceal with their discourse, is that they are also designing for oppression. Anytime they are designing high-profile products that only the rich people can afford, well, that's designing for privilege and also designing for the exclusion of people who cannot afford those products, but also people that would feel uncomfortable, feel that they are poorer or they are less cultured, they don't have access, they are excluded. So there's not just a thing about economic accessibility, which was something that some modern designers were concerned about. They tried to make more affordable but even so, making it more economically affordable doesn't mean culturally uh, relevant for the masses. And the masses that were excluded either through economic or through cultural means, they were also oppressed. And here is an example of a chair designed by Anne Jacobson, uh, a Danish designer, 1959. It has been since, this egg chair has since become an icon of modern design and redesigned and appropriating several um, underdeveloped conditions as a, uh, some kind of aspiration and bent to uh, some very oppressive interests like for example treating individuals as the center of society or as the um, strategy for innovation and changing society. Here is former president um, of Brazil Jair Bolsonaro um, receiving a gift, um, a Brazilian design style uh, uh, egg chair and as you can see the chair itself the design of the chair itself hasn't been changed with ex exception of its cover with is now in Brazilian colors but it, it doesn't change basically the design the fundamental design is still this individualistic and colonialist design that tries to impose a vision of people being um, enclosing their own worlds each person is an egg each person is a is a bubble each person is protected by modern design, by the, uh, their bubble. So each one, each person div, uh, d, um, has the right or the privilege to stay in their own world. That's definitely one of the uh, uh, principles behind modernist uh, design research programs. But since we were interested in doing something different, we asked this question, is it possible to design for freedom instead of for oppression? This is the basic research question of the design research program, Designing for Liberation. To get there, um, I learned from the work of Jesus Martin Barbero, a Colombian philosopher of communication, that we need to shift our attention from media to mediations. And I translated that in my master thesis in shifting from interfaces to interactions, looking at how um, uh, interaction design has been enacted into contextualized uh, situations and situations where people were not just users, they were also designers and they were interacting together through these interfaces. And the important thing was not the design of the interface, but the design of the interactions through the interface. That's why I claim that we should also shift our attention from interface to interactions, as much as communication studies have done before based on Jesus Martin Barbero's writings uh, claiming the shift from media to mediations. Inspired by this earlier research work I've done as part of my master program, I designed several courses, environments, and infrastructure to experience this collective creative freedom that thinking about social interactions before thinking about uh, objects and things. And uh, I cannot avoid talking about one of these greatest experiences I have together with other great people in Brazil once we try to 
start a new interaction design institute uh, out of scratch. So we com were completely self-funded and from 2007 to 2014 we did so many cool experiments with the cutting-edge technologies of that time like Lego series play, like uh, Lego Mindstorms, like Arduinos, like toy hacking and many other new emerging materials, digital materials that are becoming available for uh, designers in this new field called interaction design. And we always approach these foreign technologies as something to be connected to our Brazilian culture. The concept of um, interaction was understood in this more relational way and not just a mechanism that those technologies provided, but as something that had to do with our um, culture. And we were building upon this tradition uh, pioneered by Gilberto Gil, that was at that time Minister of Culture, and who brought this great open source creative commons um, approach or cult in, the, in his ministry, in his term. And he sparked a movement, or he was one of the leading figures called Digital Culture. He was one of the first uh, high-profile artists to record and, and share uh, a full album on Creative Commons as an example of what something that uh, other artists could do with his work. Several artists had built upon Gilberto Gil. <laughs> he kept inspiring people even after uh, he stepped down of his office. And we, in, in Fabulous Interaction Design Institute, we kept investigating this issue. How could we do interaction design as part of this emerging digital culture in Brazil. And around 2010, we came to this concept of um, uh, design uh, being a kind of a black box that we had to open up. And at some point we realized we had to make it transparent so that people would see the box, what is inside. If they want, they can get in the box and change it from within. And that, that was in contrast, for example, with the uh, colonialist or imperialist a view of um, Apple design, which was at that time quite influential into what it was, what is now called user experience design, but that back in those days was called interaction design. And we tried to create an alternative based on free software, not open source. We were really in tune with these more politically oriented approaches to digital technology that Richard Stallman and other pioneers in Brazil were uh, uh, um, yeah, proposing uh, to be more relevant to our digital culture movement. And we wrote a book in 2012 reflecting about what we are trying to do and the future of design. It's called uh, Design Livre. There's a translation to uh, Spanish made by uh, a collective in El Salvador called Diseño Libre. We don't have currently a translation into English. But what we mean with this book is that design could be as um, profound and as um, concerned with the people as, as free software was, uh, and it is, still is, in, in many places in the world, underdeveloped communities can only get access to the internet, can only work and, and produce um, value if they rely on free software. Because proprietary software is always dependent on this multinational uh, and digital colonialist uh, enterprises. For example, the Google uh, Drive Suit. We couldn't do go, uh, actually design livre using Google Drive Suit. We tried that at that time, and it didn't work because it was very hard for uh, the general public to participate in those projects. It was difficult to remain open to the public. So instead, we decided to design our own platform, and that was called Corais. We built it out of, from scratch based on uh, some uh, free software frameworks like Drupal and um, Open Atrium. And as we design in the public using the same uh, platform as a meta design project, many other collectives beyond Faber Ludens joined. And we were surprised that a lot of uh, digital culture entrepreneurs and uh, collective cultural producers, they started to use our platform to redesign their economies. And then we joined forces. Uh, we started to participatorily design the platform with these uh, emerging collectives, and and we came up with a great innovation called the social uh, the social currency feature. That was striking so many 
and even a hundred of different uh, collectives that have built on this tool, and they could uh, manage an entire uh, solidarity economy based on this system. A uh, solidarity economy is based on self-management and the work that people do instead of being framed as volunteer work towards a collective which is a bit vague, it is framed as an uh, economic transaction under solidarity terms. And they use their own uh, currency as a, a way of formalizing this economy and building up self-consciousness, collective self-consciousness. So you could see, watching from this dashboard, that the economy was established for this specific collective at a certain moment because most of the participants of it, they were having um, a positive balance. So as you can see, not many people are in debt. And that's a good sign in an economy, at least in a solidarity perspective, because in capitalism, unfortunately, there is this weird system where being a lot of people being in debt, including big nations, is a good sign. Well, that that's why capitalism is always uh, turning into crisis. But I don't want to divert from the main topic. What we want to do is to keep uh, defining the characteristics of this design research program. And at some point we came with a, a, a research question that was even broader than we thought before because we were dealing with some very basic fundamental aspects of our society. And then we came to this question, what is the difference between freedom and liberation? That was also a reason, that was also um, uh, provoked, stimulated by engaging with English. Once we started to write in English, to talk about our research, then we saw that the words livre and liberação in Portuguese, they did not exactly match with the words freedom and liberation in English. And, and we kept with these four words grappling with them, and we came to the conclusion that we had to distinguish. And we are also being pushed by these new collectives um, organizing and occupying platform, uh, core ice platform. They, they were social movements, indigenous communities, popular educators who had a different agenda that we had at the Fabio Ludens. Of course, we were fighting digital colonialism from the ground up, but these uh, other collectives, they were fighting against racism. They were fighting against uh, the genocide of indigenous cultures, the loss of languages, of cultures that uh, were considered to be on time of uh, pre-modern and outdated. And this amounted to 700 projects. After engaging with them deeply and even sometimes doing some uh, in-place or in-lossy visit, we really changed the way how we approached uh, designing for liberation. Or at, some time, at that time, we were talking about designing for freedom, and then we shifted to design for liberation. And then we started to ex design experiences and service to strengthen these social movements liberation efforts. Social movements, they talk about liberation because they consider that uh, freedom is not guaranteed by current society. So we have to uh, work out to produce this collective freedom. That's what liberation means. And the uh, Worker Party in Brazil, which is a, uh, a party that is pretty connected with several social movements, but first and foremost with the workers' movement, uh, this uh, government had this idea of deepening down uh, participatory democracy using digital tools. I was called in to participate in this project in 2015 and we redesigned a map called Dialoga Brazil, which is, uh, was a great opportunity for 200,000 people to participate in giving a critical feedback on the governmental uh, programs. And of course, this great initiative was interrupted by uh, the white coup that uh, took over uh, Dilma Rousseff's uh, term. She was impeached in 2016. And unfortunately, this whole uh, attempt to build up a participatory design culture all across Brazil and government, uh, yeah, faded away. With the subsequent governments, this hasn't been picked up, unfortunately. And being sharing this experience with my students, uh, once I started teaching there in 2015, they were so much concerned about the future of the country because we were running, a, indeed, a, probably the biggest political crisis of the last uh, 30 years. And they were interested in what design, uh, interaction design specifically, could do about it. We experimented in many different formats, but the speculative mockumentary, this fake, uh, futuristic, but also um, pastistic, I mean, looking back uh, retrospectively, what happened and changed the course of history, being counterfactual but also prospective about what could have been done differently. 
generated some very interesting reworking of our histories, as if we could be better and more than we were uh, in that current uh, present. So we started to experiment with alternative presents instead of talking about alternative futures in a contrasting and uh, even anti-colonial approach to speculative design. And theater of the oppressed was one of the ma main uh, methodological approaches that we used to get to these speculative mockumentaries before we actually wrote the scripts of that, we uh, explored the design space of oppression and liberation using our bodies and played out the scenarios, usually several different of props and uh, figurines and, and, uh, and costumes. We wanna really to uh, help students to embody those uh, positionalities of being either an oppressor or an oppressed and change from these positions to see the perspective of them, how the reality was completely shaped by that relationship. Later on, we had to evolve this uh, process of doing theater of the press into what is now known as theater of the techno press, really focused on technologies and medium for oppression, a medium that amplifies oppression into this overall digitally structured society. It becomes part of the infrastructure of society on the top corner, you see our experiments done at Federal University of Technology, Parana, where we really try to understand, for example, how uh, digital technology like social media stimulates people to become more egocentric and at the same time exploitative of each other social capital. And on the bottom, in the middle part, you see some experiments of doing uh, theater of the techno press online um, remotely uh, and improvisedly because of the uh, a pandemic hit in 2020 and we were really trying to grasp uh, digitally ways of being embodied and still keep this relationship in the check between the oppressors and the oppressed in several different settings uh, evaluating not just the traditional uh, class relationship between workers and, and their bosses but also between um, uh, women and men gender relationships between uh, um, uh, white people and black people, racial relationships, and uh, international relationship between global North people and global South people. We put uh, all of this into check throughout our Design for Liberation uh, program. And back into uh, the University of Technology Paraná, uh, we were trying to build an ideology for this um, emerging way of designing uh, by the oppressed, for the oppressed. And we wrote uh, a manifesto, uh, basically combining different perspectives of these uh, students who are mostly women. And we came up with this concept of monster aesthetics to explain the kind of uh, expression we were trying to get. After writing this manifesto and wear it down and having this ritual of collectively embracing it, we started to experiment of translating the aesthetics into graphic design and we wrote another version of this manifesto which was more detailed using Google Drive as in, a, in an attempt to appropriate and subvert its biases towards uh, collective design because nobody could um, uh, concentrate or gatekeep the graphic design. Everyone could change the graphic design all the time. We got this very busy uh, uh, manifesto design that challenges all of the colonialist uh, traditional modern design, graphic design rules that our students learned and they really wanted to draw attention to the fact that we should be critical about reproducing those patterns instead of just um, putting them forth in their work. And finally we came to this guiding research question that really got us into the track of drilling down what is oppression, what is liberation, what design can do about it. And by 2020, we had these great interactions and great uh, partnerships and projects coming out of the Design and Oppression Network. And it started with a reading group, online reading group during the pandemic times uh, around relating Paulo Freire and design research. But then later on, we related Franz Fanon, Augusto Ball, Bell Hooks, and other authors that wrote about uh, oppression we devised a, a, cons a systematic or systemic way of understanding oppression and also liberation that is still pending to be published, more on that in the future. 
But mostly what we got from the design oppression network was a, a pedagogical approach for um, building that into a massive scale. And at, at Federal University of Technology, by now we had this great opportunity of founding a new laboratory called LADO, Laboratory of Design Against Oppression. And I work closely with uh, Michael Maserotto, Claudia Bordin, and, and, and Fernanda Border, and several students uh, uh, work with us. Hundreds of students have passed through our activities. They uh, were experimenting and trying out different ways of explicitly facing certain oppression, not just class, gender, and race, but also the what is known as user oppression, which was a great discovery that we made around about that time. While well, look at the history of uh, design research, anytime someone is called a user, um, that person is being oppressed. And we were trying to design, not for user, but as a user, looking at the world as design against us. That's a completely different way of learning how to design that we uh, pioneered this laboratory. We try to share those findings and to unite with other laboratories in the Design and Oppression Network through the Design and Press, Designs of the Pressed online course. Two editions have been gone already and all of the materials are online for anyone to check as open resource, educational resources. We had people from several worlds um, participating and we were really trying to experiment with different ways of doing design. And later on, and building up on this growing network, we had these colorful papers at uh, Designer Journal, um, a Chilean journal that's defined academic standards by having colorful papers that are, and special issues that are one after the other, pretty subversive and counter to the uh, modernist canon. And we had the opportunity to uh, um, guest edit together with uh, uh, Leslie Ann Noel and Rodrigo Gonzato. We had two issues um, with um, yeah, a couple of, uh, a dozen of articles trying to bring up these uh, methodologies, um, theoret theories, and approaches for design that were coming from what is now known as Global South and the oppressed in general. Design in Liberation, Design Thinking for Liberation has developed as an experimental design research program characterized by crafting certain aesthetic qualities. So here comes um, the last aspect of what a design research program entails, and it's probably the um, highest level of abstraction. We try to look back the history of design and oppression network uh, um, in the last three years, uh, well, the first three years of its existence, and see what was in what it was being prioritized in all the projects we were dealing with. And we came up with this number of six uh, aesthetic qualities like freedom, criticality, solidarity, autonomy, dialogicity, and monstrosity. Each one of these qualities are typically produced by those designing for liberation projects. And they are manifested uh, graphically and also time in a, in a time perspective in different ways. So it's not possible to say these are visual principles. They are also describing uh, temporal aesthetics. But mostly then uh, aesthetics of something static or something which is objective or a thing, we were concerned about these relational aesthetics. The, the aesthetics that is perceived so clearly when we dance together. And we rely on this metaphor or maybe even the practice of dancing together in the Siranda traditional Pernambucan dance. And you see how the Siranda became a kind of an organizing principle for LADO, for Laboratory of Design Against Oppression. We organize our working groups, each one of them as a Siranda of people that would shift from one Siranda to the other working group. So each working group was operating as a Siranda with rotating tasks to avoid a leadership arise and a person to become an oppressor of others, become specialized and, um, and climb the ranks and become an authority on top of a hierarchy, which is the model on the left side of the picture that we wanted to avoid. And building upon this uh, metaphor of Siranda that uh, we, we had as an organizing principle at LADO, Marco Mazzarotto, my 
uh, collaborate to that level and also Bibiana Sepa collaborated from another laboratory in the uh, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Bibiana Serpa and Mazzarotto, and Marco Mazzarotto, they wrote this incredible paper published by um, published by the Design Research Society recently about a militant design research methodology for design against oppression. And it's represented visually as a flower, but it's based on this uh, relational qualities of dancing together. Well, several design researchers beyond that network have contributed to designing for liberation. I'm going to show quickly this picture of my uh, co-authorship network. And as you can see on the right side, uh, my co-authors in the Design Oppression Network are very important for this uh, design research program. But I also have collaborated with people elsewhere outside of Brazil in the PD Commoners Network. They're also concerned about liberating ourselves from capitalist society. And the Citational Justice Collective, which is concerned about epistemic injustice, which is part of the colonialist uh, framework and system and the Pluriversal Working Group that has people, several worlds within this world. And we are also concerned with several kinds of systems of oppression, but in a different way than the Design Oppression Network does. And there's definitely other people that are not being visualized in this uh, citation network because the works are under review, hasn't been published yet. And we share a vision in the Design Research Program. It's not always clear, not everybody share all of the elements of it, but basically, we have this uh, dichotomic worldview, which is not something that was imposed, or that we define. It was imposed on us. As people that have experience of being the oppressed side, we know that our world is different from the world of the oppressors, the world of people who have privileges. The difference is not just cultural, it's an ontological difference. And therefore, it shapes our experience of reality in profound ways. And on the top, you see design practice that reproduces those differences or ignores those differences and say there's not such a difference. Everyone is equal. Uh, the basic uh, biological foundations of humankind are the same. So we have cognitive principles that can be uh, focused on, for example, in the Gestalt, by the Gestalt theory, semiotics, and so on. These are all oppressive design practices, and they are fed by design methodology of the North and design ontology of the North. What we want is to explore what is in the bottom, a bottom-up process of design practices, find oppression, six liberation. And for that, we need definitely to interact with design methodologies of the South and design ontology of the South. There are two different processes of doing that, decolonization in the ontological um, level and hybridization in the methodological level. And all of that has has the goal of producing aesthetic interactions when the privileged will work together with underprivileged in conflict. But a conflict that we produce um, a new relationship between these different groups that perhaps could help change the oppressive structures and inaugurate and announce a society that is liberated from oppression. And, for, and I, by that I mean all kinds of oppression, not just class oppression, but also colonialist oppression, gender oppression, uh, um, uh, transphobic oppression, homophobic oppression, uh, and several other sim uh, systems of oppression that keep the historically underprivileged from becoming more than what they could be, and overall keeping humanity from evolving culturally towards more becoming more human in general. And the third experiment set is something we are busy right now at MXT program at the University of Florida. I cannot share the, um, the news because we are still um, trying to figure out what will work uh, in this design, uh, this design for liberation research program. And stay tuned because I'm going to write about this and, and publish more lectures in the future. And my website, my, the references for this lecture is online. You can also check them later on. Thank you very much for watching and please share this with someone that you'll find could be interested on these uh, issues.